I'm not even going to try, Taylor. I'm not even going to try. Um, it is a very South African colloquialism. So we have found uh, the remains of a golden orbweb spider. Not the spider itself, but its junk pile. And uh, just found a little dangling bit of spider web hanging out of a silver cluster leaf. And almost like those stickers that we put on glass doors so that we don't bash our heads in them it kind of works like that to make the web look quite obvious to something that's walking through so there's quite a marvelous amount of insects in here i'm just going to move it over a little bit more i'm going to pull it by its thread shall i look at all of that look at all of those insects in there <laughs> Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. <laughs> Jono, you enjoy Lord of the Rings, so do I. And she, well, I suppose these are insects that we see here. Jono reckons this reminds him of Lord of the Rings. There's no, there's no bones in here or orcs. So it's, I suppose it, it does give a sort of a semblance of that. But because it's done in the microscope, I suppose it looks like the armor and all of that that the orcs would have been wearing in Lord of the Rings. But quite marvelous indeed how it has been utilized it wings there of alates natural no I don't think anything will, will eat this I mean there's wings and exoskeletons uh, body parts that are very difficult to break down there's no nutrients or nourishment in the exoskeleton of insects that I know of um, it's like the prawn shells. When you, if you eat prawns, I actually for one eat the shell because it helps to fill me up. But I don't think we're able to digest them very well. So I think most organisms would leave them. Here is the junk line that I have. And it's lost its color. It might just be wet. But isn't that marvelous? All of those insects, probably her entire season of food that was caught in her web, uh, she dispatched of them all, uh, maybe not even needing to envenomate them, but she would have drained them all of their body fluids because insects are full of liquid and fluid, a hemolymph inside of their body, which everything uh, happens inside the body. We have our circulatory system and uh, everything gets pumped around through veins and networks, but the insects exoskeletons on the outside and inside they've got this fluid called hemolymph that actually oxygen and food and everything moves through it the way that the heart pumps inside an insect's body it kind of moves this fluid through there's not the same system that we have very very different so spiders just put their sort of fangs in like a straw and just <laughs> suck it all out so i think that's I'm a slurper apparently. Yes indeed. So just like a milk chick. So let's walk out of the tent and see if we can find anything else as the sun is starting to come out in the morning. Okay. We have the sun. Well we have the sun. The birds are quite happy that it's starting to dry out and it appears as if Ralph Kirsten has managed to reposition and he is back with that hyena. Yes, thanks everyone, and I've, I've just come down quite a lot closer to this to this den. Um, the reason why I've done this as well is I would like to, now sorry for the grass there, I'm just obviously trying my luck just to get a little bit closer to her, also just to try and let her be relaxed with us, at the, with the vehicle next to the den here. She's still very relaxed there. Um, if this is a den indeed so that, that's obviously the little habituation and we can make a small little track down here and um, and get her used to us already if um, if that is indeed a den well that's the idea that we could be able to come down here on a regular basis and have a lovely go to and if there's going to be some cubs and everything well that would be absolutely fantastic but as I say, this is all just projecting something that I'm really hoping for. It does look like that is what is going on. And she's been doing a bit of digging. And now, there we go. She's just showing herself a little bit. Pangolin, um, uh, the the little cubs, when they start eating meat, it, it's literally good. You know, hyenas are incredible. They drink a lot of milk, which is very protein-rich. And now she's come out of the hole. 
If he's not very scared of us, I don't think that that's that's a problem. But um, the little cubbies, they will um, they'll drink milk until they're about eighteen months of age, and um, but they will st they will start eating meat even in the first month. So it can be very very interesting if if she continues. There's there's a lot of activity around that hole. So as I say. I'm going to keep coming back and visiting here, and hopefully these hyena are going to keep coming in, and let's just hope that she makes it available for us, and she does indeed den here. That would be absolutely ideal. She's disappeared a little bit off into the grass. She's returned back a bit. Uh, Sarah, that's a very good question, I would say. Um, the, well, we, we, we just say male and female hyena. Um, so, uh, uh, it would, well, because the females are probably more like males than the males are. So, it's, it's a very good question, that. And I'm actually going to try and find that one out because I've never, I've never heard of, you know, like you get a ram and a ewe or a bull and a cow or a lioness and a lion, um, with hyena. Uh, I can't remember having ever heard of anything that distinguishes between the male and female. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move out of this area, give this uh, female some peace. She's, she's excavated there quite a lot, and um, it looks like lots of activity, and let's not disturb her anymore. Let's get out of here, and we will return. So, while I do that and get out of the thickets here, let's, uh, let's head you on back to Taylor and see how her morning's going. Oops. Righty yo! I don't think I've said that for a very long time, hey. Um, so it's a bit quiet. We're now going along in Yala Road North. Hopefully, the gremlins don't get us. This is a notorious road riddled with silly gremlins, technical gremlins. Now, this road is not actually that wet, so I don't think we had that much rain at all. I don't know. 10 mils of rain, perhaps that was a lot. Oh my goodness, I've just received some intel from the final control. Apparently you only have 30 minutes left if you would like to support us and vote for us to win a Webby Award. If you'd like to vote and help us win, um, please do so. You can head across to the Safari Live Facebook page and we'll it's pinned right at the top of the page the three different categories the thing you must remember when you sign up those please confirm your email address so you have to go onto your email and um, <laughs> and and uh, I'm not talking about that I'm embarrassed still from last night and yes and confirm your email and then you must vote afterwards please if you can and you don't mind vote on all th uh, all three categories also if you've got more than one email address and perhaps you're a bit bored at work you can use other email addresses too but only one one vote per category per email address uh, so yes we'd be very thankful if you could assist us there uh, I think we're winning in one category and not in two or two of them so help us out also we can't see what, um, what the sort of status is now the percentage where we lie and the awards will be uh, well the winners will be announced on the 24th of april so very exciting stuff hey something that safari live has never been nominated before hopefully it will be a regular occurrence thank you for being all so wonderful it's great oh i might have an animal rebecca i might and i feel like there's a hornbill it's quite far away but I think it's on a guari tree. Please can we look at my animal because I feel useless as safari. Well, the animals are not participating. It is a yellow-billed hornbill eating the fruit of a guari tree. Woo! Hello. Very nice. Just gobbling away. Choose the dark purple berries, though. Don't eat the green ones. They can't be too nice. Those are the unripe berries. I don't know which guari tree it is from here. We have a number of different species. But munching about... So normally the preferred diet of a yellow-billed hornbill, as we know, is insects or scorpions or worms, centipedes, 
crickets. <gasps> Viam. Viam, look. Look what's happened here. Yeah. Oh no, I pointed at them. They saw me pointing. It's a mongoose. Hello, mongoose. There's one just to the left. There we go. Hello. They're all coming out. See, I made that weird squeaking noise, and now they are excited. Do you want to hear the squeaking noise again? <coughs> Cameramen hate it. It's their worst sound that the presenters make, but it does bring the mongoose out. Yes, Rebecca, it does tickle my lips when I do it, so I'm not going to do it too much more. Vim can do it. Can you do it, Vim? What other strange sounds can we make to entice the mongoose? Let me try this one. Oh, that works actually very well. There we go. That is a more effective sound to make when you're wanting to entice little dwarf mongoose to come out because they heard the car and then they ran away as normal. But they quite like that sound. Look at them. They're all a little bit damp. Perhaps some of the tunnels were flooded last night and if you were watching the sunset safari we were looking at an old well house of a, a group of mongoose that were living there once upon a time not anymore <laughs> now Luke who's detuning today says that the, the mongoose at the back looks like it's got gel in its hair yes perhaps it is a slick a slick mongoose new species but they're also going to come out and dry and it's actually the first time that the sun is poking its head out too so they'll be very happy about that shall i make that noise again and see if they come closer <coughs> i sound like a balloon you know when you're letting the air out and you sort of pinch the edges and pull it apart no now they're not interested in me at all they're going to carry on with their day they normally lose interest pretty quickly Oh, very nice. Well, our mongoose are just foraging around. We'll see if they're going to hang around for a bit longer. Our hornbills were eating berries, and Ralph has got a hornbill sun tanning. Yes, look at this, everyone. Now, obviously, with that big downpour that we had last night, uh, this hornbill has obviously got its feathers quite sodden. So it's now, look how it's spreading it out on the branch there and just helping it to dry out in the lovely sun. So this one, I think it's it's mainly down due to the fact, uh, you see how it looks, the neck is a little bit sort of looks raw there but it's mainly this one is quite wet and you know sometimes when you've got a very uh, um, hairy dog and you bath it, it it almost looks like it's like a scrawny rat well that's exactly what's happening here a lot of the wet is making the feathers sort of push down and not fluffed out and it really making them look rather strange I mean they look strange to start with but it's looking really <laughs> out of sorts <clears throat> and that's must be the reason why he's he's trying to dry himself out he pro probably uh, you know hornbills love looking in the mirror they're often uh, pecking away at our mirrors or if you put a piece of glass anywhere uh, they peck at themselves I don't think they like the the look of themselves really uh, and um, and this one I think if he had to see himself now, I think he would really have a proper go at himself in the, in the mirror. But uh, wonderful to see how he's spreading his wings, trying to dry them out, doing the feather maintenance. And it was a, quite a shower that we had. So everybody, uh, like uh, Taylor was saying, with the, the mongoose coming out now, and they have a very close-knit relationship with these with these hornbills, I'm sure she would have mentioned, but we have um, we've mentioned that many times before. And they have a, a very good, healthy relationship, the two of them. And the hornbills often go and wake them up because the dwarf mongoose very often are late risers, especially when it's cold or it's been raining a little bit. Up, oh, off he goes. He's just gone onto another branch. As soon as I spotted something else, there we go, we've got a squirrel. And what's he eating? It looks like a marula pip. You see what they do? They, they There's three little sides on that pip, and the kernel on the inside is very rich in protein, and it's quite tasty as well. So the little squirrel is trying to get those those three little 
sides off that you can get in onto the inside of that pip and access that kernel on the inside so the the marulas have passed and and it's only those pips left so it's only the squirrels that are able to access a little bit of extra food that's still stored inside the seeds wonderful Oh, well, that was a nice little stop with a hornbill and a squirrel. And now we're heading down towards Twin Dams. Let's go see if we can find and get lucky with a little kitty cat. Shaylee, you're asking about this little bird. Now let me see if I can stop here and he doesn't fly off again. Let's get a nice clear shot. Shaylee, that bird is maybe about one or one and a half years old so not very old he's quite a young one i would say two years at the most so not very old shaley but for a bird that's quite old they don't live as long as we do so a bird of two years old is maybe as old as a, maybe 20 years old so that one is is old enough to go out on its own doesn't need mommy or daddy to look after it but uh, it's able to fly and able to get its own food and okay everyone i'm gonna head down to twin dams and while i go and see if we can pick up some leopard tracks or something like that let's head you back to steve in the tent well, we are once again out of the tent, soaking up the sun's rays, warming us this morning. And we have found a little... Where did he go? Well, here he is, though. There's a bit more in the light. We found a little wasp-like creature. He's over here. I've never seen anything specifically like that before. Got that very long ovipositor type thing coming off of his bottom. Oh! Sorry about that. You're right, eh? Yeah. Can you see him here, folks? Yeah, we got him. How marvelous is that? The insect lovers of the world, please let me know what this is. Definitely an insect. I'm, I'm thinking it's a type of wasp by the sort of just the, the abdomen shape and that ovipositor at the back and potentially a female because it has no wings. But I honestly could not tell you, to be honest. I wonder if any of you out there would be able to tell us. But what I found quite amazing, we just, I was busy moving this, this stick that it's on because we wanted to talk about this tree. It's a tree we haven't discussed too much. And I think I might have solved a problem that I've been trying to figure out the last few days about something I found the other day that an elephant had pulled up from the ground. And the tree that we are looking at here is a beautiful acacia. And here we have it. Here's Acacia exuvialis. Acacia. Oh, watch out for the waterbuck horns behind you, Dave. Ecos for sharp, meaning the sharp points over here. All South African acacias, well, most of them have got this sharp point. Uh, they are now referred to as Virchilia. Um, I still like the word acacia. Um, La sharp point there. Ecos meaning sharp. And exuvialis because as you saw where that waspy type thing was, the bark is quite flaky and it sort of, what's the right word for it? Uh, the flaking of the bark. So it's almost peeling off. I can show you a little bit. Here you see it all just peeling off over here very easy to identify it's got sort of like a pinkish orange sort of color to it and uh, beautiful pom-pom like flowers um, all acacias produce a pom-pom like flower it might not be exactly round like that but might be quite long but it's very similar in its design and they also have a bean or see a bean type of pod um, which is one of the reasons they are legumes in the legume family as well and I, the, the debate that I had, I was asking James the other day because I found sort of a hole in the ground where a tree had been removed and we got this really nice sort of um, bulb or tuber with like a bark covering on the outside. Inside was a sort of a sweet potato-y like thing and I'm thinking it might be this because you can actually use the, the, the you can cook the roots 
very much like a sweet potato. So I'm thinking it might have solved my problem. I still have to ask Herbie when he gets back if he knows what it is. But a marvelous little tree. And so um, this is only supposed to be flowering up until February. So with our late rains, we're now seeing the flowers. So there we go. Even the plants are getting confused. Well, Hyena Ralph is at the elephant carcass. And guess what he has found? Yes, we are here at the elephant carcass. Ooh, Senzo, I hope you're not getting a cold. But, um, well, that little sneeze got the hyena up. And I tell you what, when we were in the Maasai Mara, uh, I used to laugh with Archie because whenever he used to sneeze in the back um, when he had a cold, um, the hyenas all used to pick up their heads and almost start coming towards the vehicle. And it was almost like they'd identified a, a, a weakness and they were coming to see if they could eat it. So careful at the back there, Senzo. This one hasn't got its friends around, but you can see how it, it shows a bit of interest in any kind of little sneeze or sickness. But it's here next to the elephant carcass, and I'm sure it's just come to have a little nibble and see if it could get some more out of the bones and things that's lying around. And very promising for me that we're seeing another hyena in the same vicinity as that potential den site. So I'm putting, I'm hedging all my bets on that being our little hyena den that we can start watching. And you know what, maybe we'll even be able to put up something like, and I'm not uh, making any promises, but maybe I can, if we, if we do find something like that, we could even set up something like a den cam. But I'll speak to the tech guys and see if that's a possibility. We'll see. So it's that time of the day, the sun has now come out, and very often that's when the, the predators such as hyena and lion especially start to just take their, their rest. They've been active most of the night. This one looks quite dry. Maybe been quite active during the night. Now, Gilby, that's quite interesting that your dog used to growl at you when you sneezed. <laughs> you know, my dog, I've got a basset hound, and he just um, puts his head sideways when I sneeze. Uh, he's quite, he's quite comical. But um, growling at you, that's uh, that's quite interesting. Maybe he's got a bit of hyena in him. So there's that bar again. Sorry for the the rain cover, and we've got a couple more hyena now next to the the, the carcass. That's wonderful. Well picked up there, Senzo. I was busy watching that one sleeping. So they're all coming in. There's lots of them around. I wonder if this elephant carcass has actually brought these hyena back into the area. Because it seemed like that they'd moved off. But there's lots of them around now. And there's a little bit of chewing going on. And there, that one's trying to bite on something. I'm just going to wait a little bit, and then in a minute I might... Oh, and there's another one behind. There's lots of them around here, everyone. There's lots of activity here now. Hyenas everywhere. One, two, three, four, I count. There's another one walking through there behind. That's it. Ivy, I think you are absolutely right. Welcoming party. Well, you know, I do miss my other family there at the Northern Clan in Kenya. And so maybe these guys have come back just for me. I hope so. But I think more so they, they're interested in getting a little bit of a scavenge off this last remaining piece of, of elephant here and I can hear some crunching going on with these ones in front so I think I'm going to try and shift forward so we can get a better view well Jillian we're going to find out exactly what is left of the carcass because I can hear some crunching going on so I think they're getting stuck into those bones let's go have a look I don't want to disturb them though I would like to just sit and watch them some animals going down to the water hole behind as well. But I'm more interested in what these guys are up to. Don't be scared, hyenas. I'm just going to come in nice and slowly. 
don't mean any harm. You can carry on doing what you're doing over there. There we are. Okay, I'm just going to turn for because of the pole. Sorry about that. Let's just turn a bit. There we go. There we are. That's it. Now we can see them nicely how they're feeding. Still a bit of scraps left. It's quite interesting that that skull has been moved. And I don't think anything is big enough. Oh, you know what? It looks like it might have been burnt. I wonder if some of the management has done a bit of a a job on it to try and get the smell away. I don't know. It looks a little bit burnt there. It has moved. I was thinking when I first saw that it moved that possibly some elephants had come around and they often sort of shift the bones around and kick them but very softly, you know, sort of nudging them. You see they're getting stuck into the bones, eh? They're also trying to get into the marrow. Zachary, there is some, some bone marrow, so they can get in there, but they've got a lot of bone to go through. So these hyenas, they won't be coming here for nothing. They know that there's still some tidbits to be had, uh, but, and they've got to use their very strong, jaw, strong jaws to get to it. So it's quite a lot of hard work. Look at that one. He's really trying to crush into that, and even just grinding off the edges of that bone, still give it something to feed on. Look at that. He's carrying it a bit. Wow, I'm so stoked that they're still coming around. This must have been a hive of activity when it was fresh. I saw on the dam cam and a couple of the screenshots that you guys put through that there was lion and leopard and hyena and wow, it must have been amazing. But it still continues and this is performing a very important function, what the hyenas are doing here, breaking down these bones getting them decomposed a lot quicker. Now, Ravinda, um, bone marrow will dry up, um, but obviously it's enclosed within the bone. So if it's not exposed, it will um, take a lot longer to sort of decompose and dry up. Uh, so if they can crack it open, they'll get in there and there will be a little bit left. It's, it's obviously going to dry up, but um, it takes a bit longer because, as I say, of, be, of being enclosed within the bone. That's wonderful. I love watching hyena and this one. Close to us here, yeah, looks like it's getting stuck into the into some of the vertebra. Well, I'm going to stay here while these guys get stuck into breakfast, and uh, I'm starting to think about that too. But while we do that, let's head back to Taylor and see if she's had any more luck with the mongoose. Mm, not much at the moment. Very cool that there's some hyenas still lingering around that carcass. So, VM and I have just been sort of bumbling about, chatting about life and such and all these wonderful things and that there's 39 minutes until safari ends which means then that we can make ourselves a cup of coffee or hot chocolate or a cup of tea it wasn't cold now there's a bit of a sprinkle happening there's a dark low-laying cloud that's just you know, i don't think you'll be able to see it because of our roof but you can sort of see that gray area sort of just sprinkling down on us now maybe we're going to get another uh, bit of rain i hope i hope not too much more though I don't know how I feel about the rain. We've had lots of it. The bush is so green and lush and lovely. Although the animals will be very happy. We would be very happy if we could find some animals, like a herd of elephants. So we're going to drive in Vubu Road now, which does not mean elephant, it means hippo. So we're going to just go around, jump onto, and then maybe go down Gallego, one of those roads, maybe venture a little bit closer towards Sydney's Dam. Just check the northern corner. But at the moment, we're not having too much luck. Our mongoose eventually disappeared. Oh, hello. 
Here's a little terrapin. Hi, Tanisha, the terrapin. Off it goes into the grass. Not really sticking around, though, I'm afraid. A little one, maybe in a little mud wallet somewhere, making its move on a day like today. Ooh, right. Well, our terrapin, terra, what can I say, turtle dwarf? No, because it's not a turtle. Anyways, Steve's got something under the microscope that I don't think is going to go anyway. Well, it nearly went somewhere. We got a gust of wind through the side of the tent flap there that blew everything apart from this. Now, I wonder if anyone out there actually knows what this is, and it's actually quite easily identified by this white bit on it there, and all of this here, sort of a brownish conglomeration. It is, in fact, the scat or droppings of a gecko. I'm guessing it's a gecko because we have quite a few geckos living in the tent, but it's the first time I've ever looked at this under a microscope. And what is very important to understand is that lizards, reptiles, and all of that, um, snakes included, do not have, or they have the ability to excrete uric acid, which is this thing over here, which is a very concentrated form of nitrogen waste. Um, we have obviously we urinate and we have urea that we excrete but that obviously loses loads and loads and loads of moisture so earlier I was talking about the desert biome lots and lots of animals including mammals in that biome have the ability to excrete uric acid which means they can reabsorb huge amounts of moisture from their diet and from their digestive system and it enables them to survive in very dry climates now, we have lizards living inside houses or wherever they might be. They don't have the ability to run around and pick up moisture or go drinking. They get probably most of their liquid from the animals that they eat. And so it's very characteristic to find this sort of pouch on the end of the droppings on all reptiles that come out. Obviously, if they are very aquatic, uh, there is space for uric or for urea to come out. But because these animals are not aquatic, that is a very characteristic sort of sign. But uh, what I was looking at and very interested on the dung is when we looked deep into the brown bits, you can actually see the bits and pieces of obviously the geckos living in here is feeding on insects, primarily insects, where it gets its moisture from. But like the spider that had that junk web, when we looked at this underneath the microscope, there's actually clearly little bits and pieces of the exoskeleton of insects in and around here. If you look there, there's lots of little bits and pieces or flakes. You can almost sort of resemble it to prawn shells. Obviously, they're much smaller. They've been gobbled up by the gecko and then swallowed a whole and then digested in the system. And the stuff that doesn't break down in the stomach comes out here. Cobalt we do. We've got many, many geckos in South Africa. I couldn't tell you how many, but tropical house gecko, Turner's thick-toed gecko, there are many. I am not by no means a herpetologist or a reptile expert, but there are many, many, many geckos. And um, the reason why we get this double here is like birds, reptiles only have one exit when it comes to waste and mating and so the, the urea or the uric acid comes out of the same hole as the dung that's why it's easy to identify with the droppings of reptiles as well as birds okay so let's go back over to ralph who is super excited he's found all the hyena on juma Thanks, Steve. Well, I hope it's not all of them. I hope there's plenty more to be found. But uh, it's been one of those epic hyena mornings for me. Romit, um, with hyenas changing plans, um, clans, sorry, I thought it's plans. I was going to say, yeah, they change their plan all the time. Uh, changing clans, Romit, um, is um, mostly down to the males. They become nomadic, so they will um, they'll get chased out of the clan that they they born in, um, or they leave on their own accord because they get pushed onto the periphery and they, they're not allowed anywhere near to the den site. And the females are in charge, so they become nomadic and they, they literally just wander around and uh, they'll go anywhere that they'll be tolerated. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yes, the, the males will change... <coughs> Excuse me, everyone. I've got something stuck in my throat. Uh, the males, they move around 
all the time. And any way that they'll be tolerated, especially when a female uh, uh, would desire to mate with one, a uh, very lucky male that could uh, indulge, be indulged, and, and then immediately after would be chased away. So they're not allowed to be feeding near the carcass. They have to find their own food. And they have to scavenge even off their own kind. Uh, they're not allowed near the den site. They're not allowed near the cubs. They are really almost just um, a, a, a useful evil and and once their use has been used they are banished once more so you don't want to be a male in the hyena world because um, you're absolutely uh, untolerated and useless except for that uh, reproduction and that's all they are there for the females rule the roost and uh, well that's the way it is and it's very interesting indeed and that's one of the reasons why i find them so interesting uh, amongst uh, a hundred other reasons, but uh, that's one of them. It almost goes against the flow of, of, of most mammals and, and uh, across the board. So it's uh, very interesting indeed. And this one's dragged that piece of bone behind the bush there. I don't want to start up and move closer because I might, I might um, just give her a little bit of a fright. I'm just hoping that she drags it back out where we can see her nice and clearly again. You see, these hyena, they're not as habituated as those ones in the, in the Mara. And that's what I was saying. I would like to try and habituate them, especially if we can find a, a den. But that means spending time at the den as much as possible, um, just like they have done in the Mara. A uh, Colin, um, it's difficult to find a hyena den because of the vast distances that hyenas move and now it's gone completely behind the bush there. Um, and I think I'm going to try and get us a better view. Oh, no, she's moving again. Okay, let me just finish the, the, the question here. The, the, difficult to find a hyena den because they move such vast distances and, um, and then you know, you, you think you see a lot of hyena here around the carcass, so you think, well, okay, there must be a den here somewhere. Um, but they could literally have their den even up to 50 kilometers away. And they're just coming to drink and feed and off they go back to their den. So it's, and you know, they split up as well. So it's not as easy as saying, okay, let's just trail one and see what happens. It might be a subordinate female and then she, she's on the periphery. She doesn't even get to go near to the den site. So you've almost got to just spend enough time with one clan that you can work out who is uh, some of the higher ranking females and especially if you can find a matriarch or if you can get seriously lucky, like what we have potentially done this morning, and found one actually starting at den site, which we hope we have. But, you know, chances are I'm completely wrong, but I'm just hoping for the best. So, you know, it's, it's almost down to luck. But spending time and just being, you know, consistent and persevering, eventually you can find that, that site. That's what happened in the Mara as well. I just got some information uh, that led me to believe in the area where they might be denning, and eventually I found it. So, you know, that was wonderful. But I think, oh, there, she's dragging that bone now out again. She's got her prize, and she's trying to get the last little smidgens of meat off of it and that is extremely impressive how you see how strong those front quarters of her um, body is very muscular as well as the neck and the jaw everything is so powerful from the shoulders upwards it is it is immense and how she picked that bone up, it's just heavy. I got out there the other day and picked some of these bones up. They, there is not one light bone around. They all weigh a few kilograms and a good dozen pounds at least. And that bone that she's busy with, I would say, is, is probably a, you know around 10 kilograms or so, around 22, 25 pounds. And she just picks it up like it's a you know, small piece of wood. Really trying to get into it there. Extremely strong jaws. Able to crush those bones. Q 
Cupid, that is one of the animals that I still strive to see in my life. I've never seen a striped hyena. Um, I've seen the, the uh, striped jackals and uh, side striped jackals, but I've never seen a striped hyena. I've seen the art wolf, which is also part of the group. So you've got the art wolf and the striped hyena and the spotted and the brown. Um, lots of art wolf. I've seen lots of those. But the striped hyena has eluded me. I think they're the rarest of the lot. And, um, well, that's one of the animals I do want to see. So I think we'll just stay a little bit longer and see what she gets up to. And um, while we do that, let's head on over to Taylor and see maybe she's seen a striped hyena before. I cannot say that I have ever seen a striped hyena before. I've only seen a spotted hyena and I've seen brown hyena and I've seen odd wolf and that is all. That is all I'm afraid. And so we are just not winning on this sunrise safari, are we? Uh, but we're trying. We're still looking for birds and things. The weather has now changed. I mistakenly took my jacket off because it was so hot. The sun was baking down on us and uh, well, I was about to break into a sweat. And now the wind has picked up and is gusting and it's all looking a bit moody again. I think maybe we might have some daytime rain. No, sorry, I just want to get this correctly. Guide Monkey, what does it mean for the animals that the raining season has been delayed? Well, it hasn't. It's actually extended now. So, ah, uh, okay. Oh, no. Fiam's lost his water bottle. Where did she drop it? Vim was going to jump off the car quickly. Where is it, Vim? No, I don't know, Rebecca. I actually don't know why. <laughs> That's why I winked at Vim. Let me get, let me quickly grab it for Vim. Sorry, I'm just disappearing behind the car, but you will still hear the sound of my voice. You can still hear it. Ah. Ow. Stick got me. There you go. Well done. I mean, that's a problem when you're bouncing around in cars. Ah. Wait, up we get. Put my jersey on my legs to keep me nice and warm, so I'll get plugged in in a minute. Um, bouncing around in these roads. I can't tell you how many times my phone has fallen out of the car. I've actually thrown it out a few times, not on purpose. My water bottle, the camera, has almost fallen out of the car a few times too. Notebooks. And now... He was waving his hands at me. I don't know. I think he wants coffee or something. He's going, well, it's tea time. No, I'm just joking. Uh, anyways, I think we'll go down this road over here. What was I talking about, Rebecca? Okay. Can we quickly finish my story, though? Um, basically, we uh, the rainy season is extended now. So there's going to be a bit of cold weather coming through because the temperature is going to drop and the insects are going to be about still which is going to be quite nice birds like this one over here is going to be very happy yeah i'm talking about you yellow billed hornbill who seems to be the star of the show today looks very intrigued as to what i'm going to say next perhaps i need to choose my words wisely for that big eye and so it's going to be quite nice well it also mean that the herbivores that are feeding on grass and leaves are going to be exceptionally happy about that too well, especially with the grass, because the grass is just going to get greener and greener. The uh, insects and things will also be around. Bye-bye, little hornbill. Off it goes. Very nice. Quite nice to see. I'm sure you would have seen on that nice close-up on its bill how a bit some of the beak were actually flaking away. So you will start to see that hornbill sort of rubbing its beak quite a bit, just trying to get rid of those. All that. Well, I suppose it's like old keratin, hey? Very cool. Nice. At least the hornbills a playing part. Rebecca, what did you want me to do just now when I stopped listening? Look at that drongo. Just mobbed that same hornbill. Okay, well that sounds very exciting. It seems as though Steve is being a clown this afternoon morning and is making funny faces. <laughs> How so, Taylor? 
I'm not quite sure how I'm being a clown. But we have walked out again out of the tent to bring in some wonderful things. And the grass that we talk about all the time, that there's still some debate about its scientific name, Panicum Maximum, or a Blue Guinea Grass. Um, I never get that one quite right, but I do know it's Panicum Maximum. And a marvellous grass. I've got it underneath the microscope. With the rain, we have got beautiful little seed pod there or should I say the flower you can see that the it seems to be the male parts with the pollen these sort of top pieces this is my porcupine quill pointer that seems to be the pollen that the wind will sort of blow it around and then these other little filamenty looking things seem to be catching pollen on them and this is probably the female part of the flower so unbelievable seeing this underneath the microscope I mean these are the things that we're walking around every day and eating and throwing in our mouths and we've seen the guinea fowls walking around and even the warthogs munching these seeds and a very very palatable seeds indeed they are as is the grass very tasty I'm sorry it's moving around so much there's a, a horrible wind coming in from the side of the tent but I just absolutely love how close we can get in and have a look at how this is all moving and working and because of the late rain these grasses are seeding again they are flowering again and they are growing again so marvelous for the ground cover as I've said before marvelous for the the seed eating birds which obviously because the seeds and the grasses I mean this is just the flower will soon produce the seed um, so the seed eating birds will most likely breed again as we've seen the widers are in breeding plumage some of the indigo birds that means that the waxbills and uh, uh, partilias and the like, which are seed-eating, which are seed-eating birds, are in fact in, around and about and enjoying themselves. And uh, marvelous that we're seeing this this time of year. Yes, it's late rain, but um, it is part and parcel of what's going on in the world at the moment. And we are enjoying the nice cooler conditions and the moisture. And it seems like the rain has softened the bones. And let's see how deep into the bones those hyenas are going with Ralph. Yes, everyone. So one of the little, it seems like a more subordinate f a female. Um, she's, uh, she's got herself a bone now. She's just gone a little bit of a way off. There we go, Senzo. Can you get her there? And she's just there by that termite mound now. She's taking it away. All of the others have moved off. I think they've, they've had their fill. And uh, it's not a very hearty meal what's left here now. So this one has now just got itself a small bone there that it's just feeding on. It's getting in there a little bit. I just wanted to see... Ah, oh, I think that's probably it. So it's now time to go and take some rest. And it's actually... Now we've got this cloud cover, cover coming back again. It's cooling down once more. I thought we were... We were in luck and things were clearing up a bit, but um, looks like it's gone all cold again. So that hyena is now pushing off. We're just close to twin dams as that hyena does disappear off into the grass. Let's head on down to the dam and see what else we can find. I think there might be, I did see some zebra and stuff coming in. <coughs> Jason, I haven't seen hyena take down a buffalo live. I've seen it on, on, on videos and, and on documentaries. Um, and generally what they do is they circle it uh, and they start getting in at the hind end. I've actually seen a very gruesome kill of a buffalo bull and um, they started on the testicles. And that um, bull buffalo screamed screamed as buffalo do as they ripped off its testicles and obviously from there it lay down in extreme agony and they all just started feeding but it yeah hyena are not exactly good killers they look they just start um and so it's not not very not a very gruesome it's not for the faint-hearted but uh extremely efficient um in, in, in hunting, just not uh, very clean killers. They don't go for the throat, they go for the back end and they start eating. 
Okay, everyone, it seems signal's dropping a little bit, so let's go on over to Taylor and see how she's getting on while I get around the dam. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, man, why do all the things want to run away from us? It's going to be very difficult to see, but you can use your imagination. There is a daker. Hello. Can you just step out a little bit so we can see your face nicely? I can't even tell you right now whether it is a male or a female as it is tucked away, doing a very good job concealing itself. It's almost like there's nothing there. I bet if you've just joined us, you're probably like, Taylor, what do you want about? There's just branches. But there's a mammal there doing what it does best, only revealing itself once it moves. And I suppose that instinct to freeze is very, very important for the very various antelope species, in particular, aren't you? If they stand dead still like that and they've got the wind on their side and if a leopard or a lion hasn't spotted them prior we're probably going to have absolutely no idea and could result in a leopard or a lion walking right past i've definitely seen that a few times especially with a smaller antelope hiding about but they're very pretty we've been seeing a lot of daca surprisingly because i mean it's obviously very very thick and they hide themselves quite well but as we head into winter, if the rain eventually stops and the grass dies down, we'll start to see the Steenbok and the Dacre a lot more often. Now, something that, oh, it is, it's a little male. I can just see the horn sticking out of its head now. Now, one thing I'm really, really hoping we'll one day get live, I don't think we've ever seen it before, is a Dacre eating a little mouse or maybe some chicks of sorts. I've been so lucky. I've actually seen it quite a few times. Not with birds, though. I've just seen them eating rodents of sorts a number of different times it would be really really quite cool i still never forget the day that i was told that that dacre will consume small rodents and then also little birds and things like that or if they find a nest on the ground they'll eat the chicks i didn't want to believe it but they do it's the most incredible thing i suppose it's like watching warthogs occasionally feed off of carcasses i've never seen them do that at Brent at an incredible sighting now Rebecca and I are very disturbed because um, movie club last night movie club consisted of myself Rebecca Alicia Luke and Conrad we um, I'm gonna go forward we'll see if, maybe if we pretend we drive past we'll get another better view of the day we watched a movie last night we could not turn it off it was called jungle it's got Harry Potter in it and uh, he's obviously not Harry Potter. Aww. I'm going to go forward a little bit more. Not the best view. Ah, typical. As you stop running away. But at least we got a decent view of it for about two seconds. Maybe not even two seconds. Half a second. And uh, the one point, I'm not going to tell you what it's about because I'm not, I don't want to spoil it or anything. But it was quite a good movie. I highly recommend it. Um, basically... Harry Potter eats a, he finds these blue eggs and he's starving now and he opens them to eat them. I think he was hoping that it was just going to be yolk and he could, you know, eat it that way. It wasn't. It was the developing chicken side of it. Goodness, we were all outside gagging. I didn't know that a movie could almost make you get sick, but it did. Oh, we've got more mongoose. But watch it. It was quite good. Let's see if they're going to come out. They're digging in some elephant dung. I can hear them. There's a huge colony around here. Right, are you ready for the squeaky noises? Rima, I can see one. You see that silver cluster leaf? Just down to the right of it. There we go. That one's doing all the talking, too. Oh, no, that's the wrong sound. <laughs> Apparently, these mongoose don't speak the same language as the other ones. But let's go to Ralph, who's got a tortoise that's crawling about. I don't know if you can see him there. Uh, yes, we did have a tortoise. He just disappeared off into the grass. I'm going to just try to move forward. And sorry about that pole. He, he actually, you know, if they say slow as a tortoise, well, not as slow as a, uh, a speaks hinge tortoise, because they can move pretty fast. And it's very much like our local resident, uh, Madam Gregory, I'll just see if we can get a bit of a spot on it over there. 
How's that? So you can see its little scutes there in the in the thickets there. There it is. A little bit of the colouring like a a leopard tortoise. Now you see those ridges um, on the, the, the scutes. Now I was educated quite nicely by James because uh, I said that you can tell how old it is by counting those ridges and in fact it, you can tell the age by looking at that but it wouldn't be by year. It would be from dry season to wet season. So obviously when it's wet season they, they have uh, uh, increased growth and when they have dry season or season of uh, less resources you have then a ridge. Uh, not ridge, a trough. So you go from trough to ridge, trough to ridge, accordingly with um, high resources. You have to look back in history and work out. Sorry everyone, I don't know what's going on with the gremlins. Let's head off to Steve. I think he's got better signal. Yes, folks, and uh, as you know, we at Wild Earth have started another project called Dive Live. Please feel free to go through and have a look at the web address www.kickstarter.com. Uh, look for Wild Earth Dive Live. It's quite exciting underwater spectaculars that are happening. And Graham himself and all sorts of other wonderful human beings involved over that side. And uh, yeah, that is something new from this side of the world. Something very different and something very unique in the aspects of wildness and live and underneath the ocean. I used to scuba dive many years ago and it is a wonderful world down there. And so feel free, go have a look at the Kickstarter, dive live, see what you think, give your feedback. Marvellous. So... We have got something as well, I was looking, and we talk about adaptations to uh, harsh conditions. And it's something I just noticed, oopsie, it has moved. I had my grass nicely lined up, but we were talking about adaptations to, to all sorts of things. And here I've got the same grass species, the, the Panica Maximum, and have a look at how the outside edge of the leaf is actually red. Now the leaf is kind of growing as we speak, little bit by little bit. I think we just lost a little bit of audio there for a second. I apologize for that. Okay, so you see the red edge there. If you have a succulent back home and you leave it in the sun, you'll see the sides of the succulent that spend a lot of time in the sun actually go red. And that's because the red reflects the harshest of the sunlight rays, the UV, or the ultra UV, yeah? UV is the infrared. I'm getting confused. But the, the, the red actually reflects the harshest of the sun's rays and that's why the edge of this leaf as well has got that little red tinge to it. Which is the first time me seeing it on grass and it's not at all noticeable with the naked eye. It's very, very subtle. But those of you who have succulents back home, go and have a look at how they've done that. It is an adaptation for living in very harsh and dry conditions as a succulent. And um, I've seen it in lots of succulents that I have myself. And those that sit in the sunshine, far more red than those that don't. So from an adaptation to living in deserts, I think it is a marvelous little thing. And uh, grasses, all things out here are spectacular. And I think we're going to go have another walk outside, see what we can find. Where Nikki, the Sahara Desert is very far up north. Essentially what happens is we've got sort of southern Africa from the equator down and then a little bit north of the equator, I'm not sure exactly, I can get a map for you shortly, but then the Sahara Desert forms an enormous section on the sort of the middle of the continent and above that is North Africa, Morocco, Egypt, places like that. And below that is called the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and all the way down here to South Africa. So it seems like Ralph has found a nocturnal species. Let's go quickly over to him. Yes, everyone, and I apologize in advance because we are down in the Mlawati and the signal isn't great, but this is such a wonderful sighting that we need to try and just show you this Vero's eagle owl. It is absolutely beautiful and looks like he's trying to catch a nap. And there, look how he's swiveling his neck. How only owls can do, hey? Either way, you can just sit in one place and swivel that neck almost... 180 degrees.
either way. And he's also looking a little bit wet, like he's been sitting up in the tree or doing whatever he's been doing and getting soaked by the rain last night. But wonderful to see. And you see when he's, he puts his eyelid down, it's very pink. There we go. Now you see it a little bit. You can see that very typical raptor-like bill that it's got. Very sharp tip on the end, enabling it to rip through flesh. And he's got a lovely perch up in this beautiful tree, and it's an, in a tamboti. Very uh, indicative bark that you get on a tamboti. He looks very tired, yes. I think I'm disturbing his little nap. He's, he's probably been very busy during the night and probably quite difficult hunting. And, uh, they are very good hunters as well. The nocturnal um, eagle of the sky at night. And he will be going around catching all sorts. Mostly, you know, your nocturnal species of rodents that are going to be coming out and scuttling around. Very, very nice. There, he looks like he's relaxing and going back to sleep. Oh, it's a tough life, eh? Okay, everyone, I think let's let this owl uh, carry on its sleep. We've disturbed it enough. Let's head you on over to Taylor with some dung. We've now got tree climbing dwarf mongoose. This one is sitting on what looks to be like, I don't know, maybe a silver cluster leaf that has fallen over a long time ago, or a little bush willow of sorts. And this tiny little dwarf mongoose has decided, has decided to climb up the tree to get a better view of us. I don't blame it because we've just been lingering, loitering, perhaps we are lurking and do all the things with elves today and waiting for these mongoose to come out and forage but they didn't want to. Now, Luke in Final Control has decided that the dwarf mongoose is now his favourite animal. They really are cool to sit and watch. They're super inquisitive. I'm just sad that they didn't trust us enough to come out and carry on in feeding in the elephant dung because there were lots of them. You can still hear little squeaks coming from the others that are foraging under the safety of the grass and under the shrubs. Although I don't think they're going to have too much problem uh, with raptors and things flying around today. It's not a very nice day for flying and it is quite miserable and with the rain on and off I think everybody will be taking shelter. But best be careful and this one has sacrificed itself out in the open for the safety of the rest of the colony. And that is what I call being very dramatic. Well, I suppose it is, because it's not really looking anywhere else. It's just got its attention focused on us at the moment. <laughs> Mrs. Zero, I've been called lots of things. I have not been called a mongoose whisperer before, so thank you very much. I'll add that to the collection. I don't think so. I think I just like... I like the smaller things. They are my absolute favorite. I was called the zebra magnet today, but I um, have a relationship with the zebras. Only the McCurdy Hurdy. And that was a long time ago. Little mongoose, don't get eaten because of me. I will be devastated if that were the case. I will leave you all. And you can come and forage on your elephant dung when you want to. That's fine. Bye-bye now. Have a great day. Be safe. Off we go. They're very cute though. I could watch them for hours and hours. And, and that's what I can't wait uh, for winter. Why I can't wait for winter, sorry, is because when the vegetation does disappear it makes for seeing these smaller critters a lot easier and you can spend a little bit more time with them because you know if they disappear off the road that's fine because you can still see another 20 to 30 meters off of the road whereas now they disappear off of the road and they're gone unless they climb trees they don't normally climb trees like that they're not um typically arboreal but they will sort of i suppose jungle gym their way up fallen over shrubs if if need be. They'll sit on logs and things too. I suppose it's not a bad thing to, to sort of forage around a fallen marula on a fallen marula or even, even better a knob thorn that's got big flaky bark that scorpions and things can live underneath and lizards because that's as we know that some of their favorite food. Let me just check here that there's no one coming. We don't want to be driving into anybody. So not exactly a bustling game drive on my side but I suppose that's just one of those things and that's how the bush goes. Hey, the weather wasn't really on our side today. 
and I think if we hadn't had the rain we would have been able to maybe track a little bit better and get a sort of clear concise idea on where we need to go who's that no oh, it was a little bird of sorts anyways right I hope you've enjoyed it though from myself and Vim we're going to send you across to Steve for the last few minutes of the show look at what we have found now it looks like something very space age and it is in fact I'm oh, sorry about the wind I'm trying my best it is the the pupa the cocoon pupa the pupation of a horn borer moth those of you have probably seen it once before on the horns of some buffalo or whatever we have in the tent and this we just found coming out of the actual pupation and it would have popped out of this as a moth but from us this morning it has been absolutely marvelous uh, the tent has been spectacular well done to Ralph and all of his <laughs> and all of his hyenas the weather has been a very interesting day Taylor and her mongooses and from all of us here FC uh, Luke and uh, Conrad the technician thanks for all the assistance from Dave myself and everyone else thank you for your questions your feedback it's been a beautiful morning we look forward to seeing this afternoon have a beautiful day